We're going to go ahead and start uh, panel 2A right here, talking about um, taking a bite data journalism in the era of big information. I'm going to hand it off to Henry, who's going to introduce the panels uh, for this uh, really, really interesting workshop that I think everyone is really big into data. So Henry, take it away. Hi, folks. Uh, thank you for coming today. I know it's, there's, there's choice, and uh, I'm glad you've chosen data journalism. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Thank you for flying, you know. I sounded like a flight attendant or something. <laughs> um, so I have three great guests with me today um, from all over the, well, they've come from all over today to, to be here. Uh, Eric Olken is the, I'm sorry if I mangle up the pronunciations today, I'll try my best. Eric Olken is the Assistant Managing Editor at the Seattle Times for Data. And you previously worked uh, as the interactive technology at the LA Times, I think that's correct? Yeah, assistant managing editor for digital. So data, unfortunately, is, is only a little tiny bit of what I do. I'd love for it to be all of what I do. Um, a lot of you will know Paul Chung. He's the AAJA. I'm going to call you the global president because uh, <laughs> national, I think, is selling you a bit short. <laughs> and, uh, he's AP's global interactive editor, and you're based in New York. Yes. And uh, Irene J. Lu, and you are the news editor for data at Reuters, and you have recently launched Connected China, which I think a lot of people will have been aware of. Um, you may uh, have noticed I have another guest here. This is Tony Yu. He's a fellow data journalist at the uh, JMSC, and he's helping run the gear today. I'm holding two microphones because we're trying something new. Um, this is something that I've never seen before, and it's, it's live data journalism. Hey, can you into the mics for the live stream? Uh, sure, OK. Yeah. Uh, is this hello, hello. Yeah, OK. <laughs> So what we're doing with these two mics is we have um, voice recognition, and it's feeding straight into visualizations behind us. As you can see, the, uh, the accuracy is not that great. I don't think I ever said release to mics. but uh, um, So I know it's a bit awkward, but you're going to see the guests speaking into both microphones at once. Um, so without further ado, I will let the guests introduce themselves uh, one by one, and use your Twitter handles as well if possible. So, uh, Paul, do you want to go first? Just okay. passing the microphone along. So, I'm P. Chung, C H E U N G 630. Um, so, I'm the global interactive editor for the AP. Um, a lot of people ask what I do. Uh, primarily go to a lot of meetings and answer a lot of emails. Um, but at the same time, we do a lot of creative work at the AP where we do everything from Syria to um, US elections to um, you know, to, to some blockbuster movies. You know, data kind of surround us everywhere, big and small. So it's part of our team to make sense of it and to be able to tell stories about it. And prior to the AP, I was at the Miami Herald. Um, I was their deputy presentation editor, where I helped them redesign MiamiHerald.com um, back in 2009. And then prior to that, I was at the Wall Street Journal for eight years um, as their senior graphics editor. Irene? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Irene Liu. I am currently the news editor for data at Reuters. Um, I've been in the job for uh, about not quite two years, um, and I was brought on to actually um, develop Connected China um, and lead that project based out of Hong Kong. Um, prior to that, I also I teach a data journalism class at uh, HKU, so I see a few of my students in the class, uh, actually current and former students, um, which is kind of cool. Um, and uh, back in the day, three years ago, when I first started teaching that class, it was called computer-assisted reporting. That is no longer the trendy buzzword, apparently. Um, two years ago, uh, they asked me whether they could change the name to data journalism, because that's way sexier, apparently. Um, and so I said, sure, whatever, it's fine. It's the same, pretty much the same course, although actually it's changed a lot. Um, you know, a bit of background. I was a political reporter trained to do radio and print, and I, uh, back in the day when I was in New York, I worked, um, I was a lead blogger, I did a television show, I filed for radio, so I kind of came into journalism, as you guys are, at a time when you really had to be able to do all different kinds of mediums. Um, data journalism is obviously something that is very, very powerful and sexy, and if you can find a way to put it into your job title or your job description or your background, you will always have a job, so it's good that you guys are here. Um, anyway, I look forward to hearing from the other panelists. Thank you. Hi, everybody. 
Um, I'm Eric Olkin, and I feel like I'm talking to you in stereo here. Um, and I have to just say, uh, wow, Henry, uh, this is really cool. It seems to be working. Um, and uh, I've never seen a live data visualization like this before, so well done. Um, I am the assistant managing editor for digital uh, at the Seattle Times, which means um, that, uh, as I said, I, I don't really actually get to do a whole lot of um, data work. Um, I spend also most of my time in meetings and writing emails. Uh, but uh, prior to this, uh, I worked at the LA Times where uh, I had the good fortune of working with um, some really talented um, data journalists and kind of leading the, um, the effort to build what we call the data desk, uh, which was a sort of a multidisciplinary uh, union of uh, graphics people, uh, computer-assisted reporting folks. I mean, the, the funny thing about that term, computer-assisted reporting, and it's a discipline that's been around in American newspapers <coughs> primarily, but other organizations as well for many years, is that today, like all com all reporting is computer assisted, right? Um, to to some degree or another, um, but uh, uh, to bring folks from from those different disciplines together, along with digital people, producers, and and developers, to um, to to not only uh, collect and analyze data, but also uh, present it. Um, so I'm. Uh, doing a little bit of that uh, and helping uh, uh, sort of assemble a group that's doing some of that at the Seattle Times as well. So it's, I, I think it's going to be an interesting discussion. Looking forward to it. Okay, great. Thank you. So I'm going to start you guys off with a, a really, really easy question. Um, what is a data journalist? Uh, Irene, why don't you start? Um, <laughs> this is the most awkward position I hear, <laughs> holding two mics, it feels very old school. And they're not even cordless. Anyway, um, <laughs> um, I would say that data journalism is what everyone should be now. I mean, you cannot get away with being a reporter and not understanding how to get information um, off of the, from, from the internet, from data sources, from open government. Um, you just can't. It's actually not excusable. You will not be able to function as a journalist in the future unless you know how to do that and to be numerate. I know journalists generally are not usually very comfortable. They didn't like math that much most of the time, but um, you have to be comfortable with that in, in some way. Um, if you're a programmer, even better. You'll definitely be more likely to get a job in the future, um, but understanding how that works is something that everyone needs to, uh, everyone needs to have now, those skills. Um, pass it on. Now, Eric, you, you work for a relatively I'm saying relatively uh, compared to you know, Hong Kong, it's, it's gigantic, but relatively small paper in the US. Uh, what is a data journalist to you? Well, I think uh, a data journalist, to some degree, is a is a union of disciplines. Um, it's uh, you know it, it's very difficult, frankly, to have all of the various skills that um, uh, that we've sort of rely on and think of in the realm of of, uh, of data journalism in, in one person. Um, so to me, it, it, it often involves sort of bringing people together um, who have uh, uh, disparate expertise. Um, but I think it is possible, um, and especially now as tools are becoming uh, easier to use, um, uh, more uh, accessible to people who are not programmers, um, for, uh, for anybody to be, uh, in a sense, a data journalist. Uh, so the, 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 as the tools become uh, uh, more accessible, I think we'll see the sort of democratization of data journalism. Um, Paul, perhaps you can, you can talk about sort of, in, and you work for a huge newsroom, is what do you look for in a data journalist? I think a data journalist is a good journalist. And you know, I, I want to demystify data a little bit because I think when people have you know, the word data attached to it, you, you kind of have this perception of what it is. When in fact, what is data? I think a data journalist is a journalist that who could understand trends and be able to look at the number and understand you know, you know, the, the, making the point of comparison. You know, what's missing? What, what, what is it telling you? So it's no different than you doing a regular story, whether you're broadcast or print really following up the, the trends and looking at you know, some of the missing threads, except that you know, a lot of data journalists do it with numbers. So you know, think about data as in another form of language. So you just basically have to be multilingual these days, and data is just this new language that you have to learn, like Chinese or Japanese or social media. OK. Do you, I mean, you, you talk about data journalism being sexy. Um, that's great for, for, for us as programmers, but um, <laughs> uh, I mean, is it an essential part of every newsroom now? And you know, what does it what does it contribute to the newsroom? Perhaps I'll start with you again. 
Well, I would say that it's in everything that we do. I mean, can you imagine a newsroom that doesn't look through budgets or cover polls or um, conduct surveys? I mean, you just, you can't escape it before. You know, if you were marginally numerate, you'd end up doing all of those kinds of number stories. Um, but now, now as more data is available online and we can actually challenge um, information using our own analysis, um, we don't have to rely on the government saying, well, we, you know, we have a surplus of 3%. We can actually look at the raw numbers and say, well, actually, you are misrepresenting your analysis or you're you know, twisting uh, your analysis to you know, find the line that you want. And I think that, in general, um, you know, it's, it's part of what we do now, and you really can't escape it. Um, and you know, the truth is that companies are using big data to make huge profits. Um, governments, um, institutions, companies are using numbers to, um, to, to serve their agenda. And we really, if we want to stay relevant, especially given the environment where citizens are committing journalistic acts every single day and have a platform on, online to be able to, um, to, to you know, publish their, their work, we have to differentiate ourselves. And that's really by maintaining our integrity increasing our skill sets and um, as a newsroom and as individuals and really um, kind of going from there. Um, all right, how, how, perhaps you can answer that question, but also sure. talk about how it helps the Seattle Times differentiate itself from, from other Seattle papers and you know, West Coast papers. Well, first, I think uh, uh, data journalism really feeds into the, the, the mission of journalism to uh, demystify things for people, to help, uh, help people understand the increasingly complex world around them. Um, we have, uh, I think, a bit of a responsibility to help interpret these kinds of, uh, of information. Um, I'd also say that you know, you, you know the jokes, right, about journalists doing math, and you, know, you get a bunch of journalists around a table at a, a, at a restaurant, and, and, and nobody can split up the bill because we don't know, you know we can't we can't wanna, do wanna, simple. You want to tell a joke to the No, 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 no. no, no, no. <laughs> right. But 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 uh, uh, well, actually, I will tell one. Is it the? Um, you know how journalists count? One, two, trend. Oh, I thought that was just the New York Times. <laughs> I didn't realize that that was the journalists in general. Yeah, well, <laughs> so it's a bad bad journalism. Is there anyone here yeah. from the New York Times? <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, I'm going to stop with the jokes. So it's clearly not my not my <laughs> area of expertise. That, so. um, this is a tough crowd too. Um, <laughs> So really, though, I think that, that, that we, you know, as journalists, uh, have to get, I mean, smart about, about interpreting numbers, interpreting, not, and not just numbers, but interpreting data as, as in, in all of its many forms um, in order to sort of help, um, help do our jobs to, to inform people. Um, I mean, a lot of stories are buried in these, uh, uh, in, in, in statistics, in, in, uh, uh, in, in reports from both government data, data that we collect on our own, um, data that we get from third parties, from corporations, there's a lot of really, really good stories in there, and uh, and I think it's a it's a, it's an imperative these days. At the Seattle Times, um, you know, the, the like in many um, uh, American newspapers, in particular news organizations more generally. Um, we've done, um, we've had the sort of the computer assisted reporting uh, team for some time, and I think th they have always been a really important part of the investigative sort of arm of the, of the newsroom. Uh, uh, today, though, what's uh, to me is very exciting about, about the, the work that we're doing in, in data journalism is that we're able to, uh, to take computer assisted reporting out of the corner of the newsroom where it's been sitting for, for a couple of decades probably, and pull it really into the center and make it a, um, a a really important part of the of the news gathering um, operation, and I, and I will show you when we do the demo, uh, sort of a, a live example of of, of that. So, uh, Paul, I mean, I know this is your job, but how important do you think your role is within 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 your organization? Well, if I'm doing my job, hopefully my role wouldn't be important because I think you know data need to be in everyone's ethos. And again, just really looking at data journalism and say, what is it that we're doing? And what data journalism will allow you to do is find unlikely stories that you would never once imagine before. And again, by crossing not just one set of data, but multiple data, m two unlikely set of data, could yield you know, a very different imagination. So I think you know, this is a great time to be a journalist because not only do you have all the existing tools that you have, but you have these deep, deep, data and, and transparency and information just everywhere. You know, you could 
just basically even create your own personal data and, and do a little bit of crowdsourcing. And that you know, could tell some kind of trend and, and say, how does that compare to an, another group? So again, I, I think you know, it, it needs to be in our ethos. And if I'm doing my job, then one day we wouldn't need a data editor or an interactive editor because everything we do is interactive and data. Um, one last question, uh, just, just on sort of a high level. Um, do you think the public are aware of, of what you guys are doing with interactive, or has it just sort of just appeared on their web browsers and they just start using it? Have they seen a change um, when it started? Yeah, start sure. Um, we, we talk a little bit about sort of information literacy and the um, the the extent to which the the our audience is comfortable with the the what we're presenting to them. Um, I have a feeling, and I don't have any hard data to back this up, um, but I have a feeling that there is um, there's a greater understanding and acceptance of, um, of in digital of means of, of uh, data visualization and data, uh, and sort of simple means of data visualization, data analysis among uh, the general sort of usership. But I think we do have to be careful to make, um, to make data um, uh, simple. I mean, not to oversimplify, of course, there's a danger in that too, um, but, but, but it's, it's important that we, um, that, we, that we give people something that, um, that they know how to use. Um, otherwise, we're just uh, uh, adding to the, to the uh, mystification. Uh, Irene, when you were building Connected China, how did you make sure that it was, was easy to interact with? Um, to be very honest, we actually uh, built Connected China to be sort of on the frontier of kind of this new world of interactive, immersive journalism. Um, we had a very small team and we kind of operated, we, we did a little bit of beta testing, but actually we did not do very comprehensive focus group driven, you know, uh, user experience testing on, on the thing. And we, we knew that even the format and the way that we built this uh, was going to be, it was going to require a bit of a learning curve for people to, to adjust because the what we did was we built an HTML5 site that works on desktop, but also really is optimized for the iPad, um, so that all those movements, the swipes, the reverse swipes, the you know kind of um, pinches and all that would be part of the experience. And so, um, you know, quite honestly, we kind of I guess you know followed the Steve Jobs route, which is to just say you know no this doesn't exist before, but you know we we're gonna just try to see how it goes and kind of push forward um, in a new way. Paul, cool. how, how important is mobile to, to the AP and, you know, and other, orga other organizations? How, I mean, the iPads, the iPhones. Well, I think you know, most of the world have a smartphone now you know, and not necessarily a desktop. So everything we do at the AP, especially interactive, is all responsive. So we actually don't care where you're looking at the information for the interactive, whether it's a desktop, your iPhone, or your Android phone, or, or your tablet, because we can't predict, right? So at one point, you used to thinking, OK, there's the standard monitor size. And then you have your um, iPad. And then you have the iPhone. And bam, what happened? iPad mini. <laughs> <laughs> totally messed up the sizes iPhone 5, suddenly is, you have that extra bit of space. What do you do? Mm -hmm. So you can't really anticipate you know, how information is going to transform. You just have to make sure that it's adaptive. And I think one of the biggest challenge with presenting not only data but journalism these days is really understanding the user behavior. We can't expect you know, user to, to adapt to what we do. We have to adapt where users are. So if you're looking at our information, do you know your latest Samsung refrigerator that has a monitor that display news, then so <laughs> be it. Like, who, who am I to tell you that you can't you know, look at news that way? Um, so I think you know, in terms of the, not so mobile, but I think it's responsive and adaptive to your personal environment is very important. And that's something that I know my team Every single day, we, we think about that. And if you look at some of the AP Interactive, you know, the way we even present the information is very different on a mobile phone to a desktop experience. Because you know in a mobile, we're not going to overwhelm you with these big data visualization. You might just want something simpler. And I think you know, to, to think about how we present information, we have to think about almost like an onion. We have people who don't really want to engage with the data. So you have to really present, here's the big point of view. Here's the big trend. And then you kind of have to leave little you know, breadcrumbs for people to, to delve deeper into your presentation and, and, and your data. So I, I think 
be able to anticipate different type of users is really important. And it's not necessarily one size fit all, but within your one set, you have to be able to anticipate high engagement and low engagement. Irene, do you, do you think that data journalism should be used to tell the story or so that the users can find out the story for themselves? That's a big debate, right? Whether or not um, we put everything out there and let people discover or whether we develop our own analysis. Um, I would say it's ideal in an ideal world, both. I mean, if people really wanted to get data, they could just make a request, a FOIA request or whatever, or go online and find the data themselves. I think that our value add is that we, we can treat data as a source. So again, you know, in the same way that you make sure that the person you're interviewing is not sketchy and not fraudulent, you also have to check the methodology and the source of your data. You have to provide a kind of framework, and also you have to tell a story. I mean, that's one thing that I think is so important, you know, is it's not enough to just spit out a bunch of numbers. No one actually, it'll, people will just glaze over and move on. What we can do, and the beauty of the kind of innovations in data visualization and um, and all this is that we can make stories beautiful. Um, we can tell them in different ways, whether it's text, photo, graphics, whatever, and um, we can engage. And I think that that's um, something that we have to continue to innovate on because who would have thought that moving GIFs would be such a kind of powerful tool that you know is used now, um, kind of for fun and for serious um, journalism as well. Um, you know, we wouldn't have thought of that five years ago, um, but I think that we just have to make sure that we're on top of it um, and that we are innovating as well. All right. Um, I mean, you come from a smaller organi organization. You probably don't necessarily have the manpower to create something like Connected China. What can a small, smaller organization or individuals, what can they do to get started in data journalism? Well, the, I mean, I'd say the first thing is um, start, uh, start collecting data, start um, uh, file freedom of information requests. Um, I, I know that, that that may be more difficult in some places than in others, um, but, but, uh, uh, but, but find, find a, a good data story always begins with the data itself. Um, so being able to um, to sort of acquire it and 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 be able to do some sort of basic analysis on it, whether that's by you know uh, using spreadsheets. We make um, we make really um, heavy use of Google spreadsheets, right? It's a pretty simple tool. Um, it, you know you can you can house a lot of data there. You can do some uh, some pretty good uh, uh, some pretty basic analysis, but but enough to kind of get you started. Uh, even some basic d data visualization right within Google spreadsheets. Um, for those who sort of want to take the next step, Google Fusion Tables, right, is a um, is a tool that's uh, uh, that's quite useful for um, uh, for for sort of analyzing, doing pivot tables and that kind of thing on large data sets. Um, so you know, being familiar with a few of the of the of the basic tools, I think is is uh, is really useful. And there's you know, there's a lot. There's even sort of published publishable quality stuff that you can do just with that, um, just by um, by collecting, analyzing, and doing some basic visualizations on data in those in those tools. Um, and then, you know, for those of you who do work in organizations with an IT department, um, make friends with uh, people in IT. Uh, that that's always uh, that's always helpful. I have found that um, that that it it, it once um, people. Um, sort of understand the objective. Um, there's a lot of buy-in from. I mean, we have, we've, we have some great people at the Seattle Times who are not journalists, who did not sort of start in the the come up in that that way, uh, very much like yourself, right? Who who of course now you can call yourself a journalist, but but uh, uh, but people who who came from other disciplines, right? Who came from a, a sort of computer science discipline and um, and sort of just. Found themselves in a newsroom and said, "Hey, this is cool." And and you know, you can I think you can sort of um, uh, co-opt some of those folks for uh, for data projects uh, if you uh, if you pitch it to them the right way. Okay. Um, Paul, uh, perhaps you can talk about you take that you you talk about uh, data a lot. What finding data is easy. When we were we were doing a project about immigration, and it was easy to find the immigration mm -hmm. stats. But what do you do with the data once you found the sort of raw data? How do you how do you create something from that? I think you know, a lot of people, it's like chicken at the egg, right? People say, well, I find this data set. What do I do with it? Well, the better question is, what is your point of view? What is it that you want to tell, right? So you have to have your own hypothesis to begin with. And does the data confirm 
your hypothesis or does it offer the contrary? So again, you know, you can't just say, I found this great spreadsheet and here it is, I, I've, you know, I discovered Go. That is the wrong assumption. You know, as a journalist or even, you know, I got my start as, you know, um, I did a lot of science when I was in, in college. You know, you always have to have, you know, your original statement. What is it that you try to prove? And does the data help support that documentation or not? And if it doesn't, then why not? So again, you kind of have to apply your journalistic instinct, the basic of journalism, into your data reporting, and not just hope for some magical spreadsheet going to answer you know, your questions or, or this spreadsheet to be able to make your story better. I mean, having a great data set is not going to make your story any better if you can't really you know, have a point of view or, or be able to, to make informed decisions from the data. Just one little example. So when I was at the Wall Street Journal, I, I did this information graphic on how I try to prove that countries with a high HIV rate actually hurts the overall GDP growth. And it took a really long time to look for data. I call the World Bank. I, I look at all these different data set to try to analyze the information. I couldn't find any. And then what I end up doing is finding a investment report from Morgan Stanley. They did a study on South Africa and looking at the, the country and say, okay, you know, if South Africa didn't have a high HIV rate, the GDP growth is actually 2% difference. So you could kind of derive that from one particular study, you know, and then looking at, you know, two different types of data, HIV rate versus GDP, and plop them in, you know, a, a double variable axis. And, and that could help you kind of come to some kind of conclusion. So a lot of times the biggest story might just come from a very discrete study or what I call like the smaller data. And from the smaller data, you kind of forecast, could you make a bigger story out of it? You know, what, what are the trends? So part of the, the, the story that I was illustrating that, you know, at that point is China had a low GDP rate and also a low HIV rate. So that means if I was, you know, an NGO person or if I was working for um, World Health Organization, I would monitor the HIV situation in China and India really closely because it could go either way. Right, so you know, based on that study alone, then I could safely say that HIV does, you know, have some kind of economic impact because government have to pay more health data. So again, it's just kind of one set of data leading you to a second set of data, and but you have to have a point of view from the beginning. I, I didn't just begin looking for data because I want to. Um, Irene, since you're teaching here, perhaps you can talk about having students uh, and and journalists that haven't been exposed to technology. What can they do to sort of learn the skills, and, and should they be learning them? Sure. I mean, I, I think that everyone should be learning them. Um, and though I would be very happy to have more students in my class, um, I do think that a lot of what you can pick up, you can actually do if you're interested um, through, in terms of raw skills through self-teaching. The beauty of the internet is, if you want to learn how to use Google Fusion Tables, there are tutorials, there are examples, there are data sets with you know the end products that you can actually walk through every step. Um, I personally, um, I wasn't a math major. I'm not a programmer. Uh, I pretty much learned everything I have, I know, just by picking it up um, on my own. And it's, it's not. Don't be intimidated. I think that's the key. Um, you know, and I would say, you know, just in terms of uh, this, the question before about um, data. I think that one other area that um, you should always think about um, is to treat not every data set as discrete, but also try to make connections because. Um, you know, if we're going down the path of trying to root out corruption and that kind of thing, people count on the fact that you only see things through one set. You know, so for example, if you're only looking at, you know, Hong Kong company registrations and you don't kind of try to make the connections or track dot, uh, you know, connect the dots with other data sources, um, you actually won't get the story. So the key is companies are doing this all the time. They take uh, they buy up different data sets and then make connections so they can find out more insight. Uh, campaigns do it for voting, um, and we should do it as journalists as well. Sounds like we have a backup career if the journalism <laughs> doesn't work out. Exactly. <laughs> um, so, Eric, in the small in the small newsroom, um, what can I mean? What do you look for in a regular reporter if you want them to do data journalism? What what skills do they need? What sort of particular <laughs> skills do they need? Well, first off, I should say. I don't hire reporters. I, I work on the uh, on the digital sort of presentation team, so you, I'd have to ask my colleagues. But I think if I channeled them, I think they would say, um, you know, we're we're looking for facility with um, not so much particular tools, but the concepts. 
Um, the tools are always changing as we see. Um, the, the, you know, today it's Google Fusion tables, tomorrow it's something even better and easier to use, I'm sure. But, um, but I would say it's probably the, um, the, the ability to think critically about, about data, um, uh, you know, to, to, um, uh, to, to ask questions and know how to find some answers. Um, that's really, I think, the most important part. Um, and that's the kind of thing that, uh, right, you don't have to be a programmer uh, or a math major uh, to, to learn. Uh, <clears throat> so what I think we'll do now is we'll do the demos, but perhaps before you demo, each of you can introduce what your sort of, uh, sorry, I know that's twisted around your foot, um, what stories you've been involved in that you've been most proud of, um, you know, in terms of data. Uh, perhaps you guys can talk about that while I just get the computer ready. Okay. So I'll start with you. Okay. Um, well, you know, I think um, I'll, I'll draw from uh, my experience at the LA Times uh, where we had a, uh, a, a one of the, actually really the first data project I was involved in there was a uh, uh, was an attempt to chronicle every homicide that took place in LA County um, which is a pretty large number um, and uh, was the effort of a single reporter who was uh, very determined that um, that that nobody should uh, should be killed um, in LA uh, and not be recognized in some way um, by the the paper of record um, the LA Times and so uh, she devoted a year of her um, career to um, to writing uh, stories on every person um, and we took that information and we turned it into a uh, to a, a sortable filterable um, database and map that uh, that really told a story um, uh, of the, the the sort of the sociological um, uh, impacts of, of homicide um, and uh, and how it uh, how it affects different uh, different groups um, different uh, different ethnic groups different age groups differently. So do you want to do a quick? Yeah, I'm not actually demoing that one, but okay, <laughs> although I can. So then we'll, then we'll go. <laughs> but, um, what? Oh, I see. Can we get the wireless mic? Yeah. No, 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 no. Do you have the handheld mic? Here's what I'm going to do. Um, do we have a I'll, I'll, I'll intro this really quickly. Um, Don't worry about that. that one. Okay. Um, th so this is um, uh, this is a project uh, I mentioned that um, uh, that we were doing um, at the Seattle Times a. Uh, Hello. Yeah. I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> you have to shout. Okay. Um, yeah. So, um, so I wanted to show a, uh, a, a project here that uh, that's that's ripped from the headlines. Uh, you may have um, uh, have seen. In fact, uh, let me show you first um, the uh, the homepage of the Seattle Times uh, site. Is this the uh, maximize? Uh, uh, yes, as big as it goes, I'm afraid. Okay, that's fine. Um, so uh, you may have heard of this uh, uh, story that happened in Washington State yesterday. A bridge, uh, a rather major highway bridge, collapsed, um, and uh, you know one of the. Um, uh, I guess it's it's a theme. I'm going to count like journalists do: one, two, trend, right? The um, the the uh, the crumbling infrastructure in the in the U.S. and and uh, in in particular uh, bridges. Um, we. Uh, uh, right after this um, this happened yesterday, uh, a couple of uh, folks on the uh, on the digital team and our uh, computer assisted reporting editor uh, got together and uh, and put together this um, uh, map and and uh, and table of uh, structurally deficient bridges in Washington State. So, um, sort of a uh, uh, where I'm just going to move this away if I may. Um, so where. Uh, where in Washington State there are bridges that have been classified as structurally deficient? Um, are there any bridges that are safe? I mean, that <laughs> <laughs> That's like all the bridges in Washington State. No, actually, the, the, the scary thing about this and the thing that, that, that I think we've actually not done a very good job of is putting into perspective um, a Washington State in, in, uh, in terms of the rest of the U.S. Uh, Washington State is actually, um, uh, in terms of the number of the percentage of bridges that are structurally deficient, is actually one of the better states uh, in the country. Um, 
so uh, there's a, there are 143 structurally deficient bridges, um, and uh, and this is a data set from uh, the Department of Transportation that uh, that has some basic information on uh, on all of them, including the uh, average daily traffic. So you can see which are the bridges that are structurally de deficient that are carrying the most people. Um, you know, this is an interstate bridge. Um, you know, th this is. Um, this is an example of a sort of a quick and dirty um, approach to, uh, to to data journalism and data uh, visualization. Um, clearly, uh, you know, it, it not a not a, uh, a case where you'd uh, be able to immediately tell some um, uh, stories in the data, other than perhaps there's a lot of bridges on this road right here that uh, that are in need of uh, of repair. Um, but uh, but the, the the point actually the thing that I'm most proud of in, in this example is the speed with which we were able to do it. So um, the story broke yesterday uh, about this time, uh, maybe a little earlier, um, and uh, and within about 18 hours, um, this uh, this database was uh, was live online, um, and that is a result of the fact that uh, we had some folks who uh, had done this very kind of project before, um, so it was possible to sort of steal code from the previous project and use it for this. And that's uh, one thing that we're really big on. And I think most people who work in this area of code reuse, right? Never do, never never build anything that you can only use once. Um, always uh, uh, think about uh, general, more general uses for, uh, for the, 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 the projects that you do. So how are you gonna drive home when you, when you get back? Which route are you gonna take? I'm gonna take the train. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Um, that I can I can show a few other things, but but this one I thought was uh, was well really timely. Um, uh, the um, you know I'll I'll show a couple of um, uh, a couple of uh, examples that use uh, some relatively simple tools. Um, so this was a map um, that went with a um, a, a project um, a Pulitzer Prize uh, winning project on the. Um, uh, the toll of use of methadone, which is a, a very cheap uh, and, and readily available drug for uh, uh, for, for pain killing, um, which was on a preferred drug list that the state of Washington um, uh, would uh, would pay for um, for uh, for people with um, uh, with the state uh, health insurance plan, um, and it turns out this drug is uh, is particularly dangerous. Um, it's uh, it's possible to overdose quite easily. Um, and this map uh, was an effort to show that the the overdoses that um, that happened uh, as a result of the uh, use of methadone were predominantly in lower income areas, the the, the lighter green areas on the uh, on the map. Um, and even though there's there's um, uh, quite high population density in this part of Seattle, very very few people um, uh, died as a result of uh, of methadone use in this um, uh, in this area um, because. The, the drug was prescribed primarily to people uh, in lower income groups. Um, so it's a, um, this was a sort of one, uh, one sort of avenue into the data that, uh, uh, that helped tell the story. Um, the, this was done in uh, Google Fusion tables. Um, uh, fairly simply, uh, the, the, the data were, uh, were imported and geocoded um, and, uh, and, and plotted on the map and the, um, uh, the shapes of the um, uh, of the, the the census tracts were uh, were overlaid. Um, okay, um, and then um, I'll I'll mention one other um, one other tool that also was um, uh, was used in the methadone project uh, called uh, Tableau. Um, Tableau Public is a um, is a is a freely available data visualization tool. Um, one of the uh, uh, one of the useful things about it is that it uh, doesn't require uh, you to be a programmer, um, and uh, and is um, uh, it's it's quite um, uh, it's quite user friendly in terms of the interface um, to uh, to building um, uh, tools. Um, so this was um, this was where sort of Washington State uh, stacks up with the rest of the country on uh, on the use of uh, of methadone. Um, the um, uh, Tableau also enables you to sort of relatively easily embed your uh, data visualization in an interactive way um, in, uh, in, in your uh, uh, website. Okay, uh, Paul, what are you going next? Because I think uh, Irene needs to plug an iPad. Okay. Do you want to just introduce the sort of projects you're proud of more and then uh, plug through? So, let's see. 
So basically, um, over the past year, you know, we have transformed all of our interactive from flash based to HTML. So one of the biggest hurdles is how do we present the information across all platforms and all device. So you know, I'm really proud of my team in terms of making data, again, filtering from a full web with experience down to a very um, small, tiny phone experience. And we're able to kind of diffuse different data as you know in different parts of the interactive. So it's not like we come out with, you know, once a year, here's our big data project. We have data projects almost on a daily level. And one of the things that I'm most proud about is we actually make the data easy for users to understand. Um, so one thing that I, I want to show is um, the Great Reset Project. So basically, this is a project that we work together with the business department where we try to look at how this particular recession is different than all the other recessions in terms of job recovery. So we are looking at you know, all sorts of different data and we come across the two sets that we really like. But at the same time, we want to kind of add a little bit of context. So a lot of things that, you know, if, if you and my team, that I, I, the first question I ask, why? Why are we doing this? Oh, because it looked cool. I'm like, I don't care, but why? What is it that we are saying? So a lot of times we really have to think through why is it important for us to show this particular data set right now and how are we presenting it? So a lot of times with some of the you know, more eloquent um, data project, we actually pair with video explainers talking about you know, why this set of data, why is it important for you to understand it? And even the way we present it, we kind of give you the option of being a very passive user experience and also a, a much more engaged user experience. So part of the premise of this series is looking at job growth, job recovery between low wage, high wage, and, and middle wage workers. And basically with this recession, we're saying that you know, a, a lot of the um, high wage workers, you know, th they are losing at a faster pace than low wage workers. So when we think about the recovery, you know, it, it really, the, the sector that's growing might be in some of the um, service sectors, but not in the white collar jobs sector. So you can see, you know, from, from here's looking at the different recessions and how the job we cover, you know, in 42 months. So again, if you don't want to do anything with the data, you could just press play and just watch. But if you want, you know, you could kind of stop at any point and hover and look at, you know, the job loss versus job gain in this particular recession. So again, we anticipate, you know, those data nerds that want to be like, oh, I'm going to be all know it all and I'm going to, you know, look deeper into it. So we kind of, again, allow for a more passive experience for people who just want to watch, you know, these dots, you know, gray, red, and, and, and how one might overtake the other to a more engaging experience where people could actually go find out the data. But we didn't just stop there. We, we also want to do a couple of video explainers, and that's when we partnered with the reporter in the business desk to really explain what the hell are you looking at. Oh. Uh, it's been followed by the weakest economic recovery since the Great Depression. For middle-income workers, the recovery has been virtually non-existent. Almost... It's a crime for you. Well, you get the point. So, and when you go through the different, you know, time period, so we try. So we explain, you know, the differences between each of the different recessions, and this is one of our reporters. So again, you know, when you think about using data, also think about your basic journalism instinct, right? Data doesn't stop at just data visualization. You know, data can manifest itself into, you know, um, you know, text and also um, video. So you can see how, as we scroll down, you don't get the bubble chart anymore, you just get a table, so that you could really look at this in, in a handheld device. So this is allow for more tablet experience to a full screen. Okay. So this is the um, Boston Marathon Interactive that um, we did. And, you know, 
And, and this is basically what we talk about, this smaller data set. So what we did is we heard a story about, you know, when, when the time that the bomb explosion ha happened, a lot of people say, well, you know, it, it, they timed it where the most runner had crossed the races and, and finish line. So, you know, and, and somehow that didn't feel right because someone just kind of made that as an antidote. So what we actually did is scrape the um, Boston Marathon database and, and break down the data. And this is the second iteration of the data. So what we did is look at the runners list and look at when their start time is and when they finish. And we highlighted the, the portion that when the bomb go off. So you can see that when the blast happened, it's actually toward the tail end, where the majority of the racer had already finished. So again, you know, this is not a big, big data project, but it shed light into, you know, some understanding of how the story happened. Because I think any time breaking news happened, people just tend to be a little bit more chaotic, a little bit more confused, and really taking a step back and look at, well, you know, what kind of data is available and what kind of analysis could we, could we show? And when we did this chart, you know, we hear back from our customers that they, they're glad that we did it because otherwise they wouldn't think about that point of view. They didn't think about it because they just take the anecdotal experience. But now we're using factual data to kind of debunk the anecdote. And then because of that, you know, the, the stories is written, we've written in a very different way. Okay, thank you. Um, so do you want to do it on your yeah. iPad? Is it VGH? Yep. Okay, great. <laughs> oh, why is it so black? Um, I think that might have been that. So there we go. Yep. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, it's China, they're watching you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, do I need a, do I need to do the mic? Can, uh, I, can I speak loudly enough I'll that? Hold it. You, you talk. Oh, you hold it. <laughs> okay. There you go. All right. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> what a great moderator! Yes. Let's give him a round of applause, everyone. All right. <laughs> Woo! Okay. Uh, multitasking. Um, so, I'm just going to give a quick demo of the of the Connected China app. I apologize because I know a few of you have already seen this little demo before, but um, hopefully it'll be better the second time or the third time. Um, Basically, um, what we tried to do at Reuters was, um, you know, for those of you who were under a rock for the past year and a half, there was this big leadership transition in China, um, once in a decade tra leadership transition, and um, we decided that we wanted to, uh, we really wanted to present some information um, to and, and create a new, a new, a new project, a new idea, a new product. Um, to kind of coincide with this very, very historical um, event that probably for the first time um, has, has had unprecedented attention from around the world. The, the story of rising China is one of the big stories um, of our generation. And so um, we thought it was a perfect time to really try to, you know, do, do you know, kind of take a, take a leap um, for Reuters and really um, push the boundaries of what we could do in terms of data visualization. Um, also use, uh, make this a sort of a proof of concept for this idea that we had, which was that reporters every single day, um, we are collecting information and intelligence. Um, not only are we processing quantitative data and, and um, that kind of thing um, from governments and from companies and economic data, um, the other thing that we also do is we report and collect intelligence about relationships, about power, about people. And um, what we wanted to do was, um, you know, for those of you who are, who are not very familiar with Thomson Reuters, we are a big data company. We're data and news. Um, we do, we, we have lots of, we, we collect and sell lots and lots of economic data, 
business data, data about companies. And so what we thought was, you know, the reporting side, you know, we, we, we file our information um, and tell stories in kind of traditional ways, text, video, photo. And so what we wanted to do was we wanted to take that collective intelligence from the um, thousands of reporters that we have around the world and develop a methodology that would allow for us to be able to um, give that information and that intelligence new life um, by storing it and structuring it in a way that could be used um, in the future. In addition to that, we wanted to find a new way to communicate that data and that information. So that's what Connected China is. Um, it was kind of the first foray into this new realm. Um, and so uh, what we wanted to do is we wanted to focus on the importance of relationships. You know, for leadership in China, um, who your mentors are, who your protégés are, really affect um, your rise up through the party and then as well as your legacy if you are a top leader and um, are retiring. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to really um, convey kind of the importance of that, of those person-to-person -person connections, the guanxi. And so um, what we did was uh, we created this visualization that allows you to take a look at all the different kinds of relationships. You can see here um, that we have everything from complex relationship in-law relative to reportedly close to. And of course, this is kind of an interesting little um, kind of visualization, but really what you want to do is you want to understand why. And so what we did was while we structured the relationship and categorized the relationships, we also then gave descriptions about um, the nature of these, these different kinds of relationships and, the, and, and give context to it. Um, what we were also able to do by structuring this information, we also structured um, work history information. So, for example, if you look at Xi Jinping's uh, record, you can see we have an interactive timeline about his own um, rise to power. All of these are structured relationships that are in a database. And what this allowed us to do was also provide an, a new layer of analysis. Um, you know, the, a function of Chinese governance is that there's this concept of administrative levels. They're very similar to civil service levels if you're in government. So across the party, military, and uh, government, certain roles have, a, have been assigned a sort of a hierarchy, a, a ranking. And so you can actually compare across, um, you can actually compare across Across, across the various pillars of governance um, to, to be able to get a sense of how people have moved up in their careers. Um, this actually then feeds right into what we have, um, what we call career comparison view. Um, and again, this is all, what's great about this is that it's a combination of you know, qual us structuring qualitative data using our judgment as journalists um, to really um, Qual quantify and qualify certain types of relationships, but also to use our um, kind of deep knowledge of this field to really assign, to, to be able to understand how, um, how, to, how to best maximize quantitative data. So the, the fact of a person working for this organization having this position um, and knowing that, that it had, a, it had an, a certain administrative level allows us then to be able to actually look and compare the rise of various leaders. So for example, here we have Xi Jinping, who is now the kind of not so newly minted uh, president of, of China and uh, general secretary of the party. And you can actually begin to compare his rise with other people. So you compare him to uh, you know, former top leaders such as um, his predecessor, Hu Jintao. You can see that Hu, if you, know, if you read biographies of Hu Jintao, they always say you know, he was the first person to be promoted to this position, or the, the youngest person to ever be promoted to this position. And he kind of moved up. And so he was actually able to kind of get promoted quite quickly. And he made the crucial step of skipping um, being coming a member of the larger Politburo and just went straight to the Politburo Standing Committee at a pretty young age. Um, Xi Jinping, you can see if you compare by age, he was uh, he you know he rose a little bit later um, in terms of his age. Now this is all interesting from an academic standpoint, but what's really really exciting, what's really interesting, is that we can then begin to actually look at um, people as they the rising stars and how they move up. You talk to any veteran Chinese reporter and you say, hey, who do you think is going to be, you know, possibly going to be leader in 10 years? And they can name people off, off the top of their heads. And when you ask them why, they'll say, well, they were promoted at a pretty young age here. They've already been, uh, you know, a party secretary in two provinces. Um, they have a PhD, whatever, whatever. So when, when you hear what they're saying, they're basing it off of their experience and their knowledge and kind of anecdotal information. Um, based on their reporting and their institutional kind of the memory, the memory they have over time and experience, right? But what we can do actually is we can begin to use 
our data to illustrate that um, in, in, in sort of a, a more con concrete fashion. So Hu Chunhua, who is um, called Little Hu, is known to be a kind of um, Hu Jintao's protege. You can actually see when you compare him to Xi Jinping that he's actually being promoted, it has been promoted at even an earlier age. Um, he's been considered by uh, kind of China watchers as uh, someone to watch and potentially a leader, um, a future top leader. Um, you can compare to others like, you know, for example, Wang Yang and, uh, you know, other people. And you can see how they've been moving up and how they've uh, been proceeding. So this is, again, um, a way where we actually created the data set ourselves, right? We took all this information that's out there. Everything that's in Connected China is actually based off of public, uh, publicly reported information and um, just brought additional insight by putting it all together. Um, and lastly, because I know I don't want to take up too much time, um, we have another area which is looking at institutional power. And so what we wanted to do was really help to unpack the very, very complicated um, kind of infrastructure of governance in China. And so what we did was we basically um, created uh, an app where you can, uh, a section where you can actually zoom in. And this is where we really get to kind of use the, the benefits of the iPad or a touchpad. Um, you can actually kind of zoom in, you can double click, you can learn more about a particular organization, you can see all the different other organizations that um, it's tied to. You can kind of expand and go in and see all the members. Now, all of this is driven by the database, which means that um, we update the database every single day in terms of the types of relationships. So if someone's promoted, if someone retires, if someone is ousted, we update the database. Um, if there's a reorganization in the government, we update the database. And what we do is then we push that update into the app, and so what this does is it allows us to, instead of having kind of a one-off infographic, we have a living app that can continue to continuously be updated, which again, for people who are interested in this field, they know they can always come back to us and get the latest information. So. Thank you, Thank you very much. Please uh, give everyone a round of applause. I just want to make a mention, and this is a really great visualization, but I just want to point out that for most journalists, do not focus on what it looked like. Because I think a lot of times when, I, when we work with journalists, they say, well, could you do it in this chart? I saw this really good. That's the wrong approach. You always have to ask, what is it that you want to tell? Right? This is a very focused experience that have a story to tell. If you come and just think about, I want to make this thing look pretty, you know, the pretty fact are going to work for like a second. Yeah, the one we get a lot is, uh, can I have a map? I want a map that shows, you know, that, and, and it's not about the end result, it's about the finding what is the, 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 the tool that, or the, yeah. the, the visualization that works best, absolutely. I, I don't mean to cut you guys short, but it's, it's almost lunchtime, so we just want to get through some questions um, from the audience. So, uh, Whoa. We've got, a, <laughs> got a lot of interest. Um, the green shirt? Yeah, you, Which no, you, you <laughs> first, then all the, the other one. Sorry, that was uh, ambiguous. Yeah, so you, you start, yeah. Hunter Green. That was really interesting, and I'm also a big data geek, but I sometimes, um, just to play the devil's advocate, I get some questions sometimes like, I mean, what is the point? Um, what is, <laughs> this is a kind of a bigger picture question for you, but okay, we've created this amazing, sexy infographic. What does it really serve to do? Uh, I mean, if it's just information gathering for information gathering sake, or does it actually lead to some sort of policy change? Does it inform, what, what is it for? What does it lead to? Um, I don't know if there's some practical experience or an anecdote that you may have on how this information actually played out and what was the impact of it on the ground. So Irene, since you've done a big sexy infographic, you know, maybe you can uh, talk about it. <laughs> well, I would say that um, that is a question that we should always be asked, right? And we should ask ourselves because we shouldn't just vomit out data because we can. I mean, that's a terrible exercise. I mean, we, we, should, we, should, we, we should always have a purpose, and it speaks to Paul's point, which is that it's about narrative, it's about stories, it's about, it is about um, giving insight to something, and that's the standard that we have for stories. It's the question that an editor will ask you whether you're doing it in print, text, photo, video, whatever. I think the point of an infographic and the point of any medium is, you, does it tell the story the best? Sometimes there are stories that you want to tell that are you don't need where you don't need actually a story. You need an infographic, you need a photo, you need a video. That's it. Or a video clip. And I think that's what we have to. And so I mean, honestly, 
I think that that's a question we should embrace as data journalists. And if you can't answer that question, then it might mean that you should find another story to tell. I can share an example from the, the methadone story that I mentioned previously. Um, the, the drug was, uh, was removed from the state's um, uh, preferred medication list um, after the uh, series ran um, and uh, uh, presumably saving uh, some lives in the process. Uh, let's take a quick couple more questions. Does anybody have a question for, for Paul? Okay, over here. Can we get the mic front of it? Hey, I'm Sharon Chan from the Seattle Times. Of course, I like to think of ourselves as nimble and Pulitzer Prize winning rather than small. But, um, <laughs> actually, that, that, that was actually Eric's word. <laughs> so, um, I do small have a relative. No, small in Pulitzer Prize winning is right. actually even more <laughs> impressive. And I was only small in relation to these guys. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, my question uh, for Paul and other people who can jump in is Are there, uh, you know, I was having dinner with some friends who work at the Gates Foundation, and they're actually really trying to think about this too, right? Data visualization to help tell their story. Are there places, nonprofits or corporate places where you're looking to that are doing great, innovative things with data visualization? You know, um, believe it or not, the Milwaukee police station, they had a really nice website that's very immersive. Um, you know, and also, you know, a lot of the AIDS foundations, um, the World Health Organization, BLS, um, Eurostax, um, which is, they're not really nonprofit, they're just government data, but they actually are doing more and more you know, their interpretation of data, which is kind of interesting because you look at how they are interpreting the data and then we download the data set and see like, well, how are they, why are they interpreting it this way? I mean, think about when Obama kind of do his, you know, um, uh, you know, key speeches and then he kind of flash you these charts and then you look, look at him just like, wait a minute. I'm like, <laughs> this is not adjusted for inflation. Lies. No. <laughs> Yeah, Bureau of Labor Statistic um, in the U.S. Okay. Uh, yeah. One last question over oh. here. Yeah. yeah. Then we'll uh, have to wrap it up. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Jason Gatewood from Rico University in Tokyo. Uh, I've got a question that has something to do. You guys briefly touched on kind of crowdsourcing in terms of using like uh, crowdsourcing uh, for data sets. There was a, a university, Humboldt University in the States, that came up with a geography of hate. Uh, what they did was they took a, a selection of tweets mm -hmm. uh, and created kind of a heat map on the most derogatory tweets. And it was, very, it was very statistically accurate, the way that they came up with this. What is your feeling on using social networking services as a data set for your uh, journalism? We actually had a discussion about that. I think we have to be really careful in terms of the sources because data is empirical, right? And, but you really have to question where, who is the one who provided a data source and why are they doing it? And especially on that particular interactive is from Twitter, which is one very narrow band of hate universe. So, you know, <laughs> and you can't really just take that and say this is the be all and end all. So again, you know, you just have to look at data a little bit more holistically. I would say that um, you know there there's a difference between um, I mean there is no data perfect perfect universe you will never have the perfect data set but I think that um, our job is really to qualify whatever we're using in terms of data as far as Twitter goes I mean it can be interesting um, as sort of an impressionistic kind of um, way another way to kind of give some color to something that's going on um, I would be very wary of using it as a as a source. Um, just in general, um, you have to vet it the way that you'd vet anything else. Um, but again, you know, the important thing is understand your data set and when you communicate it, qualify how you are using it and how you got it. Okay, Eric, in one, in one word, what is data journalism to you? Awesome. <laughs> okay, please, uh, please give the, the guests a round of applause. Thank you.